Honorable ministers, your excellencies, representatives from the private sector, academia, think tanks, and civil society, former president Thabo Mbeki, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, greetings. Whilst I had hoped to join you in person, I am grateful for the opportunity to share a few words of welcome and encouragement to all of you. First and foremost, allow me to congratulate my friend Samir and the Observer Research Foundation colleagues, my friend Max and the Tabo Mekki Foundation colleagues and other partners and sponsors on co-convening this most noteworthy, impactful and timely event. The United Nations in South Africa and indeed India see the value of such strategic engagements and is proud to partner and accompany you in this groundbreaking inaugural conference focused on the aspirations and endeavors of developing countries and peoples within an increasingly polarized world coping with the poly crisis. The journey of collaboration, exploration and innovation does not end when the conversations end. Indeed, it is when the hard work of advancing solutions, forging collaborations, convincing detractors, leveraging champions, implementing frameworks, mobilizing resources and capacities, and actioning innovation begins in earnest. We are all here with a collective purpose, to participate in and push forward a platform dedicated to shaping our world's future through foresight, anticipatory action, innovative solutions, fresh perspectives and robust partnerships. As we transition towards a multipolar world, the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, has emphasized that we need strong and effective multilateral institutions with the United Nations as the cornerstone. Effective multilateralism is one of the driving forces behind the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the recently released Complementary Secretary General's report, Our Common Agenda. Both documents envision a multilateralism that is more inclusive, with space for the contributions of all countries and communities, a more networked ecosystem with strong links and global partnerships forged through the United Nations family with international financial institutions, regional organizations, trading blocs, civil society, and others. Friends, this is a time of significant change, a time when the center of gravity of international decision-making for people and planet is shifting with South Africa chairing the current and incoming BRICS presidency and the G20 Troika led by developing countries. This paradigm shift presents an opportunity to reposition the global South and its aspirations as the primary driver of international policy discourse. As the narrative of the North-South fades, we must ensure it is replaced by a shared understanding that our futures are interconnected and our solutions must be equitable, collective, collaborative, and mutually beneficial. We need strong, multilateral institutions to respond with effectiveness to the post-pandemic socioeconomic recovery, as well as the unfolding poly crisis that the world is confronting. Aggravating climate impacts, poverty, unemployment, food insecurity, inequalities, intolerance, debt distress, and communal tensions. And that is leaving the most vulnerable countries and populations at risk or behind. This is particularly true for Africa. We are at the midpoint of the pathway to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 2023 Sustainable Development Goals Summit last September in New York stressed that there is an urgent need for redoubling our efforts, particularly to advance six transitions with regards to climate change, education, jobs, digitization, food systems, and energy all in the pin, underpinned by an SDG stimulus, a financing package to deliver what we've promised the world. Only 15% of the SDG targets are on track, with about 30% showing no progress at all. Definitely, we are not on a critical path to accelerate collaborations 
and actions to meet the targets for 2030. We need to course correct. The six transitions I mentioned are themselves intimately interconnected, requiring actions that pull levers spanning economic, social, and environmental dimensions. All of these transitions are incorporated in the thematic pillars of the Cape Town conversations, from making multilateralism deliver, to reclaiming peace, to women-led development, to achieving just transition in a green manner that will help us also advance and leverage data for development. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not abstract concepts, but an opportunity to shape real world policies that will affect real people's lives. Let us be guided by humanity, empathy, equity, and a shared rights-based commitment to a better world. Congratulations once again on the inaugural Cape Town Conversations. Africa has indeed a central role to play in the new world order. It is a continent with clear aspirations, massive potential, and a youthful and sizable population, resources, as well as clear interests. Allow me to close with a unanimous marching order that emerged from the recent SDG summit. May the deliberations this year, and certainly in coming years, be bold, ambitious, accelerated, and transformative actions towards a more inclusive, just, peaceful, resilient, and sustainable world for peace and planet. I wish you well, and I thank you once again. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the session, and thank you for the absolutely appropriate introduction from um, Nelson Murphy. Um, I think the issues of um, importance of global cooperation, if we're going to deal with some of the data for development challenges that we face, are very well put um, in, in, in the things that you've spoken about. And just to say that, you know, I think we've been speaking about data for development for some time. We've been speaking about, you know, digital economies and data economies for some time. But I think, you know, now this is what the economy is. This is what development is actually about. It's the underpinnings of, you know, multiple um, aspects of, of public service delivery, of trade, of taxation. Um, everything is kind of requiring that we um, uh, have better data, collect better data, use our data, and very importantly, have, have access to this data. I think it's become um, such a critical issue that it's been the focus of a number of uh, global and multilateral and development bank um, initiatives over the last few years. Um, and uh, um, Nelson was mentioning the importance of it in the um, Secretary General's uh, co common agenda or the UN's common agenda, and particularly the Secretary General's mandate to look at a global digital compact um, for uh, improved uh, equ uh, equity, um, and, and development and achieving the, the sustainable development goals. Um, I think if we also look at uh, the, the work of UNCTAD over the past few years, the Digital Economy Report has been looking very closely at issues around data governance and the importance of, of, of creating more equitable access um, to data for um, economic development and for, for trade. The World Bank report on um, uh, information lives, uh, data lives for the poor, um, also looking at the potential of data to, the, to provide a basis in, during COVID when it was published, but definitely in economic, you know, post-COVID economic reconstruction, the importance of data um, in, 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 you know, in building a new social compact. So um, I think it's very appropriate that we're discussing this today. I think what's been highlighted in, in the global aspects of this is that although we, many of us are dealing with this and have been dealing with data and data governance and collection of data through our old traditional public statistics and those sorts of things, um, many of the challenges we face today um, require global cooperation. They require multilateral solutions if we are going to address them. And I think there's been a lot of emphasis on um, the harms that we know are associated with data-driven technologies, um, the breaches that have been very much emphasized around privacy um, and security. And in the context of an African conversation and a Cape Town conversation, I think it's just really important to highlight um, the uneven impact of those harms. 
particularly with vulnerable people, particularly with people who by exclusion from this data economy, from this data knowledge um, base, um, you know, are invisible um, in, in these databases. Um, but more importantly, and perhaps that's what we will be able to get onto today, because a lot of the data governance has focused on these breaches, these harms, privacy, is to also look at the uneven distribution of opportunities. Um, and that really requires um, economic regulation, economic regulation of access to data, competition rules, those kinds of things. At the moment, we're looking at an enormous concentration of the data economy, of, a of the AI economy, um, between two nations. Two nations of the world make over 80, you know, hold over 80% of the revenues. Um, that's China and the U United States, or the United States and China. Um, and, you know, very little, um, Africa has particularly little, European Union, lots of people have very little, but Africa has a tiny, tiny sub-fraction of, you know, 1% on that. About 70% of the data flows out of the continent. Over 70% flows out of the continent. Um, so what can we do, you know, at a, at a continental level? I think, you know, as I said, we've, we've had lots of discussions about the need for the AU um, to become more accountable and transparent and perform its, its role in the, on, um, on the continent. Its membership in the G20 is terribly exciting um, in that it co coincides with um, a lot of opportunities that have arisen out of Agenda 2063, um, and particularly in the, in the area of data, um, a mandate from the Digital Transformation Strategy to develop an African Union data policy framework. And this was done last year. It's a, it's a really massive scope um, document. Um, I think it's pro relatively progressive. Um, and it, it really is important in that it's not just about data protection. It's about data governance. About, it's about governing both personal and non-personal data. And particularly taking these window of, of opportunities that we have are recognizing that free flows of data are absolutely critical to the African continental free trade area, to a, you know, a number of things that we're wanting to, to happen on the continent. So um, in that context, and also just to acknowledge that unlike a lot of you know, Digital Services Act and all of those sorts of things, it acknowledges some of the foundational challenges we have. It acknowledges the need for foundational infrastructures and will align very much with tomorrow's discussion on digital public infrastructures um, and the need to ensure um, you know, access to data, recognizing data as a, as a public good that has value, not only commercial value, but also public value creation. So in that context, Perhaps we can just start by um, looking at some of the ways in which data-driven initiatives in your various com companies and countries um, could, could, it, could support you know, greater inclusivity um, to increase the vis visibility of marginalized people um, and communities in the data, and also, of course, create, create opportunities so that people can, can um, generate that uh, value from, from data. So, um, Anir Chowdhury, a policy advisor um, for the government of Bangladesh. Uh, I know you've got this very exciting A2I project. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about whether that is achieving these kinds of objectives. Alison, thank you. I think you've out outlined the way we've been dealing with data and using data for policy making and making decisions. Now, <clears throat> for the last three, four years within the government of Bangladesh, we started uh, this program called Data Leadership. Now, Data Leadership looks at how to make better use of data from many different sources, not only the traditional survey-based data, but also data from administrative sources, data from user-generated sources. Uh, and that actually gave us a, uh, a roadmap for very exciting possibilities, which we were able to apply during COVID, interestingly. So COVID brought data to the center stage because we needed data every day to make decisions about health, about school closures, about lockdowns, about everything, pretty much. So one of the data sources we looked at at that time, and I want to emphasize that, how when your back is against the wall, how you look at alternative data sources uh, with open arms, which you don't when, you're, when your back is not against the wall. So we didn't have RT-PCR labs in the country. We had one lab in a country of 170 million people. So what we did was we opened up our uh, <clears throat> helpline, triple three, and asked people to do self-reporting of symptoms. And that's the data that we used. P 
people's own reports uh, cleaned up by artificial intelligence with the telcos and then called by hundreds of doctors to verify whether people were really sick. And that's how we actually created concentrations or heat maps of whether the disease was progressing the fastest. And that's how we made decisions for at least four to six months before the PCR labs were available. Just uh, last two months ago, just two months ago at the UN General Assembly, we uh, published a report that we called Equality Report for Inclusion, for Inclusive Innovation. So E-quality. And that looks at <coughs> data for inclusion, specifically on digital divide. So we looked at four underrepresented marginalized populations. We looked at women, you know that women are actually underrepresented in the digital world, call it financial inclusion, call it mobile access, call it anything, healthcare access using, using, uh, using digital access. So they're always underrepresented. So that's the first category. Second is persons with disability. Third is the extreme poor, people who don't have access to cell phones even. And the last category which was surprising for us is the cottage industry. So the informal industry which forms 80 plus percent of the economy really, but they're not digital. So those are the four categories that we started looking at and we realized that we don't have data for them. We don't even know what we don't know. And there are three areas in that report that we look at. One is access, so basically connectivity. Second is skills. We used to call these skills as digital skills. Now we say that it's increasingly becoming AI skills because people are actually talking to devices. They're not typing on devices anymore. So it's the digital literacy as a, is at a completely different level. So digital literacy as we know it is going to disappear to be replaced by AI literacy. And the third area is the issue of designing digital services. So the way we design services, sometimes it creates what Amartya Sen used to call adverse digital incorporations. We actually are creating more exclusion when we try to do inclusion. And one example is the digital services that we have created for the informal, informal economy that has in many cases hurt the, the small enterprises, the cottage enterprises, not the small ones, cottage enterprises, because now they are under the radar they have to get permits where they didn't have to get permits to do their work. So we're trying to now figure out what we don't know by looking at many different types of data. And that's, that's I think, it's very exciting work. It's only at the initial stage. We have a qualitative report, but we're working on a digital divide index now with Yale University uh, and SOAS in, in UK to look at some of these nuances of digital, adverse digital incorporation, the power asymmetry that exists in society Digital sometimes worsens things, power asymmetry worsens digitization. So there are many different, very exciting possibilities that we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Anil. And I think, you know, importantly, we, we're often talking about getting access to this big data, but there's yes. actually multiple kinds of data Correct. that we um, uh, want to get to. And just to also acknowledge that, you know, it, it is this public good. If we can, you know, it's not Please speak to the mic, please. Share it, if we can make it open. So please use the mic to speak, um, please. Oh, so sorry. So sorry, <laughs> I'm sitting on the microphone. <laughs> um, so, Anil, sorry for that. I was just saying that that's, um, you know, several of the points you made is that we often kind of chase the big data, which we're so invisible um, as a continent, um, but as the global south very often. Um, but there's so many other forms of data and meshing this data, you know, complementary data, um, you know, crowdsourcing data, getting um, data, as you mentioned, very excitingly from communities themselves that are reporting. This is all very, um, you know, uh, innovative ways of, of getting that data and just to you know emphasize that data as a public good it's non-rivalrous so Absolutely. that can be shared you know you're sharing that Creating data some sort of a data else. collective yeah from many different sources public yeah. private research even communities yeah and use that open that up to whoever, needs it, whoever can use it yeah now we just need to get access to the private data um yes please um prerna um makaria makaria Founder of Outline Africa. Perhaps you'd just like to repeat your surname if it doesn't sound familiar it's to Mukaria. you. It's Mukaria. <laughs> and Outline India, Alison. I'd love to start Outline Africa, but maybe for today we'll go with Outline oh, India. Oh, yes. Sorry. I apologize for that too. Africa focused. Um, please go ahead, because I know you also want to speak about data collection and some exciting examples of community participation. Right. Um, no, thank you for that, Alison. I think it is so important that we use forums such as these to talk about. Um, data for development, 
evidence-based decision making because I feel that um, with AI and with technology, uh, you know, the developing side of the world doesn't want to talk about its developmental challenges as much. I don't know if it's a sense of embarrassment, but we don't feel as comfortable talking about the superset of the have-nots, right? 50% of humanity is still not online. I don't know how many forums are dedicated to talking about that 50, 55% of humanity, right? And if I, if I, if I talk about India specifically, um, you know, we're doing so well on the tech front, we're doing so well on the inclusion front, but there's so much more that still needs to be done, Alison, right? 60% of us still live in rural areas, right? And when you talk about the elderly, when you talk about children, when you talk about women, how many of those stakeholders do you think really have cell phones or have digital access, right? Or are they using that digital access for the purposes that we are here to discuss today? No, not so much. So then what is the one way of reaching out to them? Going out there, deploying people, meeting them in person, collecting data is the one way and one way alone of sort of including them. And when I talk about making our data policies more inclusive, I'm talking about farmer groups, I'm talking about kids who are not learning as much, I'm talking about healthcare centers that don't provide the best healthcare out there, right? How do you really get information from them about what's happening on the ground, right? You have to have research methods which include these supersets. And so for that reason now, you know, we talk about participatory research. It's not about me sitting in my office in New Delhi or somebody sitting in Washington, D.C., who will come up with a research design and, you know, tell us what policies to implement or what social schemes to launch. It just doesn't work in the Indian context. I'll just take an example. We, we work for a big bank very recently, and this was about climate change and how it affects vulnerable groups, uh, specifically agrarian communities. And, you know, we came up with a list of solutions and innovations that might have worked on the ground. And then we went to the field and we started collecting data. And we realized that a lot of problems facing these farmers were very basic. They didn't have electricity or they had basic phones. They didn't have smartphones. And so then how do you sort of have your startups innovate for these super groups, right? Because India is still agrarian to a large extent. And then, you know, we also came, so we, we actually had to revise our list of innovations and tech solutions for these communities. We then came up with, you know, included startups that send out SMSs or voice texts or just call the farmers up so they know about the change in weather patterns and they will know when subsidies have been so delivered to the local distribution shops. And I think you really need these startups. You really need this kind of innovation, but innovation that really works in the developing country context, right? Thank you so much. And I know Baratang wants to come in on that. Baratang Mayas, the founder CEO of um, Girl Hype and Women Who Code um, from South Africa. Um, Baratang, just, I mean, I know you looking at exactly these issues of marginalization and precisely the points that have been made here. When we speak about marginalization, it's not in the context of a northern city, but you're talking about minorities and small groups of people. We're talking about the minority, majority of people on the continent. And your particular focus is on gender within that marginalized group. So in terms of sort of intersectional inequalities, you're covering a, you know, a, a spectrum of um, people who are, dis who are marginalized, including by gender. Um, just tell us a little bit about your um, work with um, uh, you know, coding and, and training and the capacity you're trying to build and the importance of accessing data um, and possibly even needing a data commons. Um, thank you, Alison. I, I'm going to start with a comment that I had when I attended the SDG um, table, roundtable discussion. The last speaker said the digital divide is very huge. We can sit here and talk about SDGs and talk about anything as long as we haven't sorted out the issue of people having access to internet. We're not talking. Because at the moment, we're talking about data, who's collected it, what are they doing with it, and it's really not touching the power of data. The people who need data, who need to be empowered, do not know that power because it's driven at the moment from profits, 
and it's driven on decision making that is really not benefiting the people that it needs to benefit. And I think it's because it's missing. And I will talk about what we do. So we started collecting our data through storytelling. Right from the beginning of Girl Hype in 2020, we were doing storytelling. And the girl, because we knew that the girls cannot speak English, we not, what we're going to capture is what we are interpreting, not what they are saying, because when they speak English, there's language barrier in terms of collecting data. So we did storytelling and they, we would see where they started and where they are in their life and how far have we reached them when they come to an end. And then we were told that's not the right way to collect data. And that was like 16, 17 years ago, the city of Cape Town helped us put together a document where we were collecting data and, you know, we measured the results. I'll tell you, two years ago, APSA came to start working with girl hype in schools to reach the girls. And the first thing they said to us is we want stories. We do not want what you captured on a piece of paper. We want those girls to be here telling us their stories because we want to see one story at a time. And for me, that made such a huge change because normally we're looking at data from a perspective of we want to change it. It's necessary. It's big decisions are made out of data um, and governance is made out of data. If I make examples, the Indians will tell you that DPI is the best thing that has ever changed India because they have proper data, they have identity captured, the finance is changing. And I mean, if we think of Togo, the government of Togo managed to change the lives of 500,000 people and apparently 90% of that was women to be paid during COVID by just implementing DPI. So it depends on who's collecting data and what data we're we talking about. But for women and girls, I fear that what's being collected is still very biased. Well, I think we can come back to that. Um, I think uh, um, Rogers um, Lilwail, uh, who's the Senior Economic Advisor at UNDP South Africa. Um, UNDP has been working, multiples of its projects has these data governance issues and underpinnings to it. Um, uh, yes, please, and I've actually been asked to ask you all too, so please also do. Um, Rogers, if you'd um, tell us what uh, UNDP is doing in this area, what initiatives there are that might address these problems. Okay, thank you, moderator, and uh, thank you for inviting us to also give our insights to this uh, Cape Town conversation talk. You know, before I go into what UNDP does, I just wanted to be, to highlight that, you know, of course, data is the oil of the 21st century. It's actually, it describes the world, and it is increasing being used to shape, to shape it. And I'll use two examples. The one of it was in The Guardian of 2019, Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez, a world designed for men. And I just want to pose these questions to you. Did you know that an average smartphone is about 5.5 inches long? It is too big for most women's hands, and it does not fit in their pockets. And speech recognition software is trained on recordings of male voices. In fact, the Google version, it recognizes 70%, it's 70% more likely to understand men. And then I think the Los Angeles Police Department, it was, you know, it, it actually implemented what is called, you know, predictive police policy. And then it was really looking at proper crime in Los Angeles. And what ended up happening, there was heavy policing. And this heavy policing was targeting black people. So you can see that though data is powerful, it's, it's not used correctly. And you don't involve the, 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 the really the marginalized. You know, they end up not benefiting from it. It may end up even putting them at a disadvantage in terms of even access to services and so on. So what does that mean? It means that if you want to be inclusive in, you know, in this collecting data and even using data for policy making, you really need to include the marginalized. And I think it talks to what my fellow panelists talked about. Make sure that the, this data is collected in the language which the the, the marginalized understand, and also empower them 
if use their community leaders. And to give a typical example, sometime when I was working in Tanzania, Tanzania had rolled out what is called this, you know, a, a social protection system which was conditional. But the way people were chosen to participate in this conditional social grant, they, they were using community leaders because they're the ones who know who are the poor. Okay? And they even monitor because it was conditional in terms of do you send your children to school? Do you go for, you know, for, 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 to hospital for medical checkup and so on? And you know, the, the degree of compliance was very high. And even when, you know, it, we're actually implementing this with the World Bank and even and other donors. And when you go there, you hear quite a number of stories. Some of these communities, these, you know, these people who were receiving these conditional grants ended up forming savings organizations and starting some projects which actually made them to graduate from, you know, poverty. So I think the issue of making sure that you involve these communities is quite important in really, you know, in collecting this data, making it actually even interpreting that data, what does it mean to them, and making this data accessible to them because you are really empowering them. And, and we are seeing this because even, I know, for instance, in 2000, the World Bank published a report which was looking at trying to understand what does it mean for a person to be poor. And they were asking really the poor people themselves. And what came out of there was quite interesting, that these poor people actually know economics more than the professors because they know what poverty is and even how to address their development challenges. And we are seeing this even in the last, the recent multidimensional poverty report, which was published, uh, you know, UNDP published every year with the OFI. And what that report shows is that when you look at even multidimensional poverty, you may you find that people are, you know, there are buckets of poverty which you can actually see these people who are poor. So even to address their development challenges, you need a portfolio approach to really move them out of poverty. And I think it's quite important to, when we talk about that, we also see it in the report which our colleagues from the Human Development Office public, which is, which is called Gender Social Norms. And that report really looking at you know, how people perceive issues to deal with, what, what are really the challenges of addressing you know, you know, you know, gender empowerment, women empowerment. And we see quite a lot of some, some interesting things there that gen we need really to tackle the gender social norms because we do that survey quite a lot every year. And really it's quite an interesting study because you see some trends, even people who say, you know, they think it's okay for a, if there is a job for a man to get that job. And really it means that if we really want to tackle issues to deal with gender, we need to look at those gender social norms. And I think our work also, we work in quite a number of areas, even when you look at the, look at even the human development in the Anthropocene, we see that when we collect the data, what we call the human adjusted human development index, countries who have got a high human development index, if you adjust it with what they are doing to the environment, it's actually showing this you know, interesting trend that it doesn't mean the richer you are, you are actually doing any service to the environment. So I think some of this even, it's, it, and we look at it and it's even influencing like the indigenous communities, nature-based, you know, nature-based, you know, development really to address what are really the development challenges. And we've seen some indigenous communities actually coming up to say, look, the way we measure development really has to change going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I think there's so many issues we, we, can, we can pick up there. Um, you know, I think while it's obviously important that we speak to communities, I think this importance of getting the data, not, we don't even know our progress towards the SDGs because we haven't got the data, certainly on this continent, but I think globally as well, and Secretary General has spoken to this. Um, but I think, you know, un, I think there's been a lot of discussion like this, but on, on the issue of, you know, data being like oil, I think there's, you know, 
a, an important point is that, in fact, it's not finite. It's, you know, it can be resourced. We can get better access to it. We can make sure that the automated decision making, if there's the right, if the right data does exist, does not um, prejudice, you know, facial recognition for um, justice and you know those kinds of things. The problem is is that without you know 60 percent, 50 percent in uh, the world, 60 percent in Africa plus of people not being in that data, it's simply impossible to unbias some of that big data that is being used and which is driving the opportunities. Um, you know, generative AI now, uh, you know, it's basically scraping the data from those who people who are online. And those of us who aren't online, you know, simply aren't coming up in the data. And secondly, we don't have the opportunities that generative AI creates for, you know, smooth lining and in, in, in improving efficiencies and those kinds of things. So, you know, this, these are very big challenges, and obviously we need to address data in these multiple ways. But, you know, how can the private sector, the public sector, um, and civil society come together to find solutions um, to these very big problems? I think if we think of, of Africa, um, we've got, you know, um, recently now a participation in, in, in the G20, which is very exciting. Um, in groups like the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, which um, India is also the president uh, of this year, um, which is a member state-based organization, there are very, very few um, African countries, and we're just not participating in the global governance discussions. Another aspect of that that I'd like you to speak out about in the context of your developing countries is very often our public policy processes. So we might be collecting data from poor people, but how involved are they actually in the public policy processes? And what are the you know, initiatives maybe that you look that you um, undertaking in your countries um, to find both local, but also to, com to participate in global governance? Um, so perhaps we just start in the middle and, and come this way, and then we'll go back there. Yeah. Um. I well, I, that, that was, what was your question? Okay, for me, I, I advocate for democratization of data because organizations that work with uh, women that really, not even women, anybody who's doing work of inclusivity, 80% of the time the budget goes to the people, the, the work. We, we don't have big researchers' um, money to be spending on research. So if you democratize data, we will have access to it, especially government officials. I'm listening to Mr. Rogers speaking about stats that I would have used very well for our organization to say, when we look for funding, it helps us because funders see that someone has done research that's very stable, um, because that gives us an opportunity to do targeted interventions for the work that we do. It gives us an opportunity to monitor and evaluate based on the research that was there, the data that's relevant. It gives us an opportunity to make informed decisions going forward for 10, 20, 30 years. And then it also gives us an opportunity to be innovative and collaborative. Um, I think in this situation is corporates and us civil society and um, the government, we all want to change people's lives. We all want to bridge the digital divide. We all want to change women and girls' lives. We want to do so much, but there's, that collaboration is what we need. And I think data gives the power to say, if this one is doing this, I can do this, I can add this. And that way we accelerate and change this 156 years that UN is talking about to say it's going to take 160 years to bridge the, the gender gap. So I think for me, data de democratization is the issue. Priyana, perhaps have... you could pick up on that right. issue. So I, I think, uh, uh, Alison, I think aggregation, collation of data and collaboration across the spectrum is the only way forward. And I think what this really requires is an alignment of incentive structures, be it between your private stakeholders, your companies, your consultancy firms, be it your startups, the innovative ones, or the tech-driven startups, whether it's your civil society members who get money in from philanthropists or foundation. There has to be a common goal that we all work towards. And I'm gonna to try and explain this via a bunch of examples, right? We took the example of 
what happened during COVID, right? And among other things, I remember my organization, we collaborated very closely and advised the state government on how they need to use their volunteers who use these apps on their phones for distribution of certain government incentives. We advised them on how we could use the same app and the same set of volunteers to now collect information about what people needed because of COVID, right? Did they need healthcare uh, amenities? Did they need food at the household level? You know, were they suffering because they'd lost their jobs? So just to get that information in, right? So in that case, we saw a startup coming forward to advise a government body using a tech platform, right? Uh, we've spoken a little bit about AI, right? Uh, again, right, uh, Times uh, did this big story on countries such as India, and I know there are a few countries in Africa that serve as the back end for a lot of AI-related work. So when I take my, Google, my phone and, you know, point it towards a bottle, for Google Lens to sense that it's a bottle, there's somebody or a lot of people at the back end who are looking at thousands and millions of pictures of bottles and telling the technology platform that, listen, when you see something like this, it's a bottle. Or when you see something like a plant, this is a plant, right? Yeah. So you need regulation around AI. So what I'm trying to say is that it requires that we regulate, that we get different parties to collaborate so Thanks. that we're all moving forward. Thanks, Bren. I'm so terribly sorry to cut people off, but we are running short of time, so I'm going to ask Rogers, please, for your two minutes, and then I'll come to Anish. I think, uh, to me, I think what is important is how do we use data for advocacy, even within these marginalized communities, because this data can be a powerful tool to influence policy and to change some practices. Going back to the social norms, we can use that data to really change these social norms. And also, I think when we talk of even how do we train these communities, and we work as UNDP and the UN, we work with a lot with civil society organizations, even in terms of SDG reporting. We actually work closely with them so that even when the country is preparing their national voluntary review, the civil society also prepare their review, which feed into that process. So that when it comes to reporting in the high level political forum, you know, both civil society will also have inputs yeah. in terms of, you know, what the country is saying. And we also support even local authorities in terms of reporting on the SDGs in terms of what is called voluntary local reviews, because when we talk of leaving no one behind, that's where people are being left behind at the local level. Yeah. So that's where we can see who is being left behind. And that's where we also identify the data gaps, what data is available, so that we can work with partners, even the national statistical authorities, to make sure that we collect that data. To just give a typical example, there are some local authorities we are, who are preparing those reports currently in South Africa. Okay. And working with StatsSA and other partners, we found out that, of course, some of them wanted to be very ambitious to report on all the SDGs. But that process has opened up the data gaps which exist at the local level yeah. and which, as the UN and other partners, we think we should work together to bridge that gap to ensure that this clarion call Thanks of leaving no one behind is addressed. Thanks very much. We're running out of time, so I'm going to ask whoever wants one question to be at the microphone, so when Anir finishes, um, we can go straight to that one question. Um, Anir, if you would just, um, if you could keep it very tight, we've got very, sure. very limited time, but thank you just to pick up on those important points of multiple levels of government participation is also very interesting. Sure. I think the first thing that's really critical right now, right now is to break the silos. I think all data lives in silos within government, within private sector, within civil society, and it's, there is no common language for data sharing. Recently, I found out in a panel when I was with the chairman of Unilever in Bangladesh, that 40% of Unilever, which is an FMCG company, is actually owned by government. So I was just telling him, so you're 40% civil servant. So the way you make decisions about data, you can teach us within the government. Ani, can you just hold your mic up so people can... Oh, can you hear me now? 
Is that better? Okay, sure. So, so the way private sector makes decisions with data, I think the policymakers, government, and researchers don't make it that way. I think there's a lot to be learned from the large corporations, not just the big techs, just any corporations that effectively use data to make decisions. We did that during COVID. We actually learned from the private sector, worked with private sector data. Why not now? That's the first thing. Second, I think, is how we visualize data is important. So we visualize data in the way that researchers understand, economists understand, not policymakers. So there is a br big bridging that we have to do. And the third is a really big education process of the policymakers in terms of how to use data from the non-traditional sources, including our NSOs, because policymakers still trust the way NSOs actually collect, aggregate, disaggregate, analyze data. And it's, it's really old school. It's very, very old school. Recently, we had a project with the uh, UN called Data for Now, yeah. where we tried to actually bring in a sandbox concept where data from many different sources would come and we make decisions using that data. And that data is administrative data. That data is coming in on a real time. From, a, from an African country, Togo, we actually learned how to use yeah. cell phone data to do real time poverty tracking. And we're now putting that to use in Bangladesh to change the way we program 16 to 70% of a national budget that goes into uh, social safety net programs every year. Wow. So if you can in improve targeting yeah. by reducing inclusion and exclusion error, which is what Togo has done, Togo has demonstrated, yeah. Yeah. that we can do something similar in Bangladesh. And once yeah. it works in Bangladesh, it's a large country with 30 million people under social safety net, yeah. so that's a breakthrough. Yeah. So these are the innovations that we need yeah. to embrace within policy making by working with the private sector okay. and the civil society. And sharing between countries. Absolutely, and Absolutely. data commons, important. I know we're out of time. We're going to, you're going to pose your question. Um, so please go ahead and pose your question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sibule Lemagini, and I'm a school principal of a low-cost private school in Kayelicha that uh, takes on girls in, from three years to 14 years, and we run a STEM program for them. Uh, my question speaks to what Prina mentioned about AI. Uh, as teachers, we find ourselves in a challenge with this introduction of AI. You know, back then when I was a, at school, we would be assessed uh, based on creative writing. You know, you write a short story, you write a friendly letter, you write an essay. Nowadays, they, these kids use AI for that. So you can't actually use that as an assessment. And as a result, AI is seen as an enemy in education but AI is here to stay. So how do we relook at education in a way that we integrate AI into the classroom and it's not, we just leverage its power uh, in, 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 in the way that it can empower the kids and use it to, to empower them and to give them knowledge rather than putting it aside as something that the kids cannot use to access information. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. <laughs> um, absolutely critical one. And we, I think that a number of people on the panel would love to answer it. Um, the problem is, you know, if you're doing this and you're trying to use generative AI in Kailicha, you put in something, you get nothing. You put that in in a you know, school in New York or something, it might be useful. Um, so definitely we'll come back to those issues with the panel after the session. Um, thank you so much, Anir. Um, your emphasis on you know, non-formal data, not traditional data possibly, breaking down of silos, sharing between countries, so important. And Prerna, you're incentivizing um, these uh, you know, um, alignment of incentives for, for, for data outputs, getting those data outputs. Importance of collecting that data from communities, so important. And Baratang, democratizing data and all that goes with it, particularly in re um, rectifying gender dis imbalances. And Rogers, I think the importance of, you know, trying to get those SDG measures, not only at the national level, where you get aggregations that mask some of those inequalities and stuff is so, so important and important to come back to, but not now. So thank you so much to the panelists and thank you to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you.